Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us for DNA Software's webinar, How to Get Digital PCR Quality Results from Your Existing QPCR Machine. My name is Greg Boggy, uh, and I am joined by Dr. John Santalucia, DNA Software's president and co-founder. Uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, and uh, uh, before I get going, I would just like to uh, give you a, a quick uh, timeline. It's going to be about a 30-minute presentation, a five-minute demo of QPCR Copy Count, and John and I will answer questions at the end. If you have any questions, please take note of the slide number uh, for your question. And, for example, this is slide two. Um, all right, quick outline of the talk today. Uh, first, we're going to go over some limitations of CQ-based methods, and John will handle that. He will also be talking about what we call counting PCR, which is a novel method uh, that we've developed, and it underlies QPCR copy count. Uh, third, we're going to go over what every QPCR user should know about the PCR mechanism, and I will be covering that topic. And John will then talk about some case studies using QPCR copy count and how QPCR copy count gives you digital PCR quality using your existing QPCR machine. Finally, we will be going through a QPCR copy count demo, and then we will answer some questions. So I will hand it over to John now who will be talking about his topics. All right, thank you, Greg. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the webinar. Um, I thought I'd give a brief introduction about who DNA Software is, first of all. Our company was founded in year 2000 to commercialize discoveries that were initially made in my laboratory at Wayne State, but then to go much further than that uh, in commercializing the state of the art in diagnostic design, and most recently, um, analysis of PCR. Uh, our, our company has been funded by nine NIH grants. And we work with some of the largest customers in the world in a variety of segments. Um, we are known primarily for our work with nucleic acid design. So we're world experts in understanding DNA-based diagnostics and designing them. We have a large proprietary database of thermodynamic parameters and a new product called Thermoblast that we're not talking about today, which is used for detecting false positives. The topic of today's um, webinar is about PCR analysis. We're going to be telling you about counting PCR, which um, we view as a major breakthrough in the field. And we're going to see that um, counting PCR allows us to get not only outstanding relative quantification, but absolute quantification for every qPCR well. And we have two patents pending on that technology. All right, let's first talk a little bit about CQ uh, methods, CQ-based methods. So um, perhaps the most widely used method for getting absolute quantification from qPCR is to make a CQ standard curve, which is shown here. And the question is, how do you get DNA concentration from such qPCR data? Well, currently um, what we do is, what most scientists do, is they um, measure the unknown of their native data set. So they would measure a qPCR curve for their unknown. Then they would make a series of dilutions with known concentrations of DNA. To do so, that requires um, the availability of purified target with uh, a known amounts of that purified target. You then calculate the CQ values for the different, um, CQ, uh, the different dilutions, as shown here, and make a plot that plots the um, CQ versus the copy number, the log of the copy number. So then you just look on that plot, well, where is my unknown CQ value compared to where it is on the plot? And from that, you can derive the log of the copy number. Now, a problem with this method is that it's laborious. First of all, it requires you to have a purified target and a purified target that's been um, quantified. Further, you have to run the standard curve. So that uses a lot of the real estate on your qPCR plate. So it's much lower throughput than what we're going, to, we're going to be sharing with you today. It also introduces inaccuracies into your process because um, it re requires you to perform a lot of pipetting operations 
and the standards themselves can have error in them, which introduces error in the whole process. All right, another use for CQ-based methods is for relative quantification. So the CQ itself, the quantification cycle number, is not interpretable in terms of absolute or relative quantification. The CQ depends on the instrument that you ran your PCR on, the algorithms that were used to fit the data, and the assay itself, that is the primer design, the master mix, etc. So all of those things make a CQ value uh, hard to interpret. So um, I showed a method earlier for absolute quantification with a standard curve. The other way is to compare two CQ values with a delta CQ method. Um, one problem with this method is that um, to get an accurate relationship between delta CQ and relative quantification, you need to quantify the efficiency of the reaction. Now, a common misconception about the efficiency is that it's constant. And that we'll see later on in the talk that that assumption of a constant efficiency is not correct. All right, so shown here, that's built right in to the equation for getting the relative concentration of your DNA sample compared to your calibrator. This efficiency single number is built right in, and that is a source of error in the process. All right, so how do we come to use to rely on CQ as a field? Um, well, going through the history of PCR, certainly the early days of using a standard curve in 1993, so more than 20 years ago, um, you know, that method has been a tried and true method. Um, and then later on, developing the relative quantification methods, and then later than that in year 2002, introduction of curve fitting methods. But really, I think the field has come to rely on CQ because they didn't have any alternative to CQ. And today we're going to share with you some what those alternatives might be. All right, so I'm going to introduce this new concept that we call counting PCR or CPCR. So this CPCR is based on a new principle in which each copy of DNA is literally counted for each cycle of the PCR. We then perform a mechanistic analysis of the shape of the PCR curve to reveal the absolute copy number at cycle number at cycle zero. Um, one common misconception is that People think that our counting PCR is the same as digital PCR. It is not the same. It's completely different. All right? We do not use a digital analysis of replicates of so zero and non-zero non copies. We don't do that. In fact, a single qPCR well is sufficient to perform our counting PCR analysis. If you do perform replicates, that's okay. It will give you lower error bars. All right, so let's give you a conceptual idea of how counting PCR works. Consider the problem of counting apples in a basket, all right? So one way to count the apples in the basket would be to brute force pull the apples out one at a time and count them. A more efficient way to count the apples in a basket would be to weigh the basket, weigh the entire basket full of apples, and then subtract off the weight of the basket. That would give you the weight of all the apples alone. And then dividing by the weight of one apple would give you the number of apples. So weight of all apples divided by weight of one apple gives you number of apples. All right, now let's see how that applies to PCR. So here is, instead of counting apples, now we're going to count DNA. And so here the idea is we go to our PCR machine, and at each cycle of PCR, we measure the total fluorescence from DNA, uh, which is shown on the tube on the left here. We measure the total fluorescence in our tube, and we would subtract out the background fluorescence. All right. And then lastly, we would divide by the fluorescence from a single molecule of DNA in the denominator. All right. So the problem, this is conceptually, I think, not such a hard thing to, uh, to, to get. But let's talk about the details. There's two tricks here. The first trick is in the numerator. The amount of fluorescence in the, that you observe in a given um, well is a very large fluorescence number and very close to the number that is the background fluorescence. So as you're subtracting two large numbers from each other. So the amount of fluorescence that's from DNA is a very tiny fraction of the total fluorescence, unless you're at the later cycles of PCR. So that step of PCR, the trick there is covered with the mechanism-based fitting, which we'll be covering in just a short moment. The other trick about this equation is the single molecule fluorescence in the denominator. And we have two methods for dealing with that. They're called uncalibrated or estimated um, calibration and experimental calibration. 
All right, so to do an estimated calibration, um, we have developed a series of empirical mathematical equations that allow us to estimate the calibration for a single molecule based upon the details of the assay that the user provides, which includes the sample volume, amplicon length, the concentrations of primers and probes, and whether or not the probe contains a minor groove binder or not. With this estimated calibration mode, with a cyber green based detection, we can get errors below 10%. With TACMAN based detection, we get calibration errors that are in the 20 to 40% error. All right, so that means that our, our absolute quantifications, if we just use the estimated calibration mode, will be in the 20 to 40% range. The reason for that is that our methods for estimating um, the calibration um, in, include some things that or leave out some things that can only be measured empirically, such as the amount of delayed onset, which I'll show later on in the talk. All right, the experimental calibration mode is where we try to experimentally dilute the sample down to less than three copies so that we can, in fact, observe what the fluorescence is from a single molecule. All right, so an important point here about this calibration is that the calibration only needs to be one one time for a given set of primers. That calibration will look, work in the future on any other instrument and at any other time. All right, so for each given set of primers, you only need to do cal experimental calibration once. If you do that, then you can get error bars um, for TACMAN. These are the TACMAN errors here. Um, under 5% if you run a 384 well plate. All right, so I'll turn the talk over now to Greg Boggy about the mechanism of PCR. All right. So what's great about mechanistic curve fitting is that it allows you to very accurately determine the concentration of your DNA or target copy number at cycle zero. So that is before the onset of PCR. Now this is quite a feat because uh, as, as we say here, the desired signal from DNA at cycle zero is about a million times smaller than the noise in the background phase. Um, and this is why we need mechanistic curve fitting. So how the mechanistic curve fitting works is that we take information from the bend in the curve where the signal starts to rise above the noise. That, that contains an incredible amount of information. And using a mechanistic model, we can then uh, use our model to back out what the fluorescence due to DNA is before the onset of PCR. Okay, and so uh, counting PCR is mechanism based. And I'll just direct your attention to the uh, mechanism that we have up here in the right hand corner. Uh, T stands for the template, so single-stranded template, uh, and P is its primer. So what's happening is uh, this is uh, our sim simplified version of PCR. We have template uh, hybridizing with its primer to form a complex, and then the enzyme DNA polymerase comes in. It forms a complex, and due to the action of DNA polymerase, you get double-stranded DNA. Now this whole process competes with a competing process in which two complementary single strands of DNA are reannealing to form double-stranded DNA. And so what happens is in the initial cycles of PCR, you get primarily the top mechanism Whereas in the later cycles of PCR, you get the bottom mechanism that dominates. And that's why your, uh, your reaction actually saturates over time. So during my PhD work, uh, I figured out that there was an analytical solution to the differential equation models that describe this mechanism. And that equation is shown here. It's a recursive model that says that DNA concentration at any cycle n is equal to the concentration from the previous cycle plus some uh, adjusted factor that accounts for growing DNA. 
Now, the behavior of this model is shown in the figures below. So as I said, this was a, a recursive model. So what happens is that your DNA concentration at cycle zero is going to uh, affect what is happening at later cycles. So, uh, so basically, uh, when you change your D0, you are shifting the curve, the, the Mach 2 based curve, uh, to the, the, the left if you're increasing. And what happens with this parameter k is if you increase k, you're increasing the slope of that curve. So, so this is how uh, Mach 2 works as a model. Now as a consequence of the way that this is working, amplification efficiency is not constant. Uh, this is uh, in direct contradiction to what many people in the field believe to be true. Uh, it's commonly believed that amplification efficiency is constant and that DNA concentration can be predicted by this model uh, shown here, uh, where, you ha where it has uh, incorporated into it the constant amplification efficiency. Now, this is very common in the field, and in fact, uh, Mikey uh, has guidelines that, that tell us to report the constant amplification efficiency of a reaction in whatever paper we're uh, reporting data in. Now the problem with this is that if you are doing uh, relative quantification, your, uh, the accuracy of your uh, predictions is going to be compromised. In fact, what's happening is that PCR efficiency changes on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis uh, because what is happening is that you have competition between primer binding and template reannealing. Uh, and with each cycle, your primer concentration is diminishing, whereas your template strand concentration is increasing. So in the beginning, you have uh, the growth of new DNA is dominant. Whereas in, in the end, you have the reannealing reaction being dominant. And this is shown in this uh, graph here. This is a typical PCR curve normalized uh, so that it, that it uh, has a maximum uh, fluorescence of 1. And the, in red, that is, is the PCR, qPCR curve. And in blue, we have the amplification efficiency. Now you see that uh, these curves basically are, are mirrors of each other, uh, so that by the time you actually get to the quantification cycle, your amplification efficiency has already decreased to around 80%, and it continues to decrease on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis. And this is essentially what causes saturation of your qPCR reaction. All right, so that is, in a nutshell, what is going on with mechanism. All right, and I will hand it over to John now to continue. All right, thank you, Greg. All right, so now I'm going to present some case studies that just illustrate um, applications of counting PCR in the real world. Um, to do so, I'm going to give you a little historical background to how we came to discover PCR, uh, counting PCR. So we were presented by a set of data from Dr. Gang Sung from Fluidine Corporation and asked um, blindly, to predict the concentrations, the relative concentrations, of uh, about 10,000 PCR reactions. We gave him those results. Uh, we, he gave us the data blindfolded. Um, he then informed us that, in fact, there was the, the data that he'd given us was a series of replicates with 72 replicates each in a three-fold dilution series. And he gave us this uh, plot that I've shown here. And the initial interpretation was, so, at each one of the each one of these represents a three-fold dilution with 72 data points on top of each other, and you can see that they're very tight. So what he said was that you know you guys did great for high concentration samples. They're, the the relative quantifications are very very tight. But then as you went to lower and lower concentrations, it seemed like they got much wider. Now this is a logarithmic scale. He said they look much wider and, and it looks like a hockey stick a little bit. So what's going on there? Well, we analyzed that data further and realized that we could learn something by taking the average 
of each of those data points. All right, so if we take the, set, the groups of 72 and average them, we get the next plot. Now, in doing this, we had a small revelation, which was that at the lowest concentrations, some of the wells, in fact, had zero molecules. In fact, at this lowest concentration over here, 12 of the wells had um, a signal, PCR signal, and 60 of the wells out of the 72 had, had no signal. At the time, we were confused by that, but of course, it just means that we have a very low concentration. And so we realize that zero is a real number and should be averaged in. This actually points out a problem with the CT-based method, which there is no CT value that corresponds to zero molecules. And that leads to problems with um, uh, systematic errors, actually, with the low dilutions found in a CT curve. Anyway. At this place here, we saw that once we averaged in the zeros, included those in the average, we observed that we had linearity over more than six orders of magnitude, from very high concentrations to low concentrations. Next, we realized that, well, if we have some, our lowest dilutions have zeros and non-zeros, we could actually use digital analysis to see how much uh, DNA was actually in there and get a calibration for the whole curve. So we did that, and at the time, um, if we use the lowest dilution, which I, as I mentioned, had uh, 60 wells that were zeros and 72 that were positive, or, or, 70, or 12 that were positive, if you plug that into this equation for digital, we could pin this lowest point to be 0.18 copies on average in the 72 replicates. Once we did that, we could reveal the absolute copy number on this axis here. All right. We, so then we realized that, we, that the highest concentration sample he gave us was a million copies, and it went all the way down bo linear below even one molecule per well on average. All right, so at this point, we were still using digital PCR uh, analysis, so we didn't really advance the field much. But we started seeing and thinking a little bit more about what was happening down in this lower part of the curve. So let's see what happens when we blow up that part of the curve. When we blew up that part of the curve, we immediately recognized that the data were not continuous, but that there was these discrete clusters of data. As you can see right here, there's, there's a clustering. If I show you this little line here, we came to figure out the interpretation of these clusters. So all of the, all of the PCR reactions that have signal in this range correspond to having a single molecule in the PCR reaction at, at cycle zero. And then this group, this cluster here is two molecules three molecules, four molecules, five molecules, all the way up. So we were able to reveal the quantized nature of PCR. This is only observed when we use a mechanism-based fitting that we can see this effect. Now, there was something else interesting in this, which was we did observe a few cases. Right here, it's kind of weak to see, but right there, there's a point that has exactly half a molecule. And for a while, this confused us because how can you have half a molecule? There's no such thing. So we realized that, in fact, this was one molecule of DNA delayed by one cycle. So we, there's this new effect called delayed onset of PCR, and we've actually figured out how to quantify the amount of delayed onset, and that is dependent on the primer design and on the template, the GC content of the template. All right. So just to verify that the counts that we're getting with the method I just showed you um, this is just showing you the observed Poisson distribution versus the predicted Poisson distribution for one of our assays. All right, And you can see that the uh, expected counts and observed are quite in very, very good agreement. You can see it in the graph here. All right, And the chi-squared P is 0.96, which is fantastic. All right, So that is telling us that the meth is working. Well, we wanted to then verify that this wasn't just something that we could get only on a fluidime instrument. So we showed that it worked also on a variety of other instruments, including here, this is the, um, at the time it was Life Technologies, now it would be Thermal Fisher, using their open array system. Um, and we were able to show that we got es essentially the same level of agreement, R squared values of 0.999 or higher. Um, and now we're plotting log absolute copy number using copy count, not using the digital PCR analysis. We then actually compared the quality of the results from qPCR copy count to digital droplet PCR. And the instrument that we used for comparison was the BioRed QX100 digital droplet instrument. And we saw extremely good agreement between the results from digital droplet PCR 
and the results from copy count. Um, I will note that there was one point off of the graph a little bit, but it turns out that that point um, was not an error from QBCR copy count. The copy count value is actually correct. Um, it was an error in from the digital droplet PCR. All right, just showing that the method works on a variety of instruments. Here is um, a BioRad CFX384 instrument showing that we can fit the curve. Uh, well, QPCR copy count says there's 155,000 molecules. The uh, validated amount from droplet digital droplet PCR was 153,000. By the way, we report not only the number of molecules, we also report the relative error and the absolute error. So the proper way to read this would be 155,000 plus or minus 7,000 molecules. And that's well within the error limit of the digital droplet PCR. Here's from a different instrument from Roche, their light cycler 480, just again showing excellent agreement between the copy count value versus that from digital droplet PCR. Here's an example with cyber green based detection. A lot of myths in the literature about cyber green and its ability to detect but here's showing CyberGreen detecting a single molecule, and we're able to quantify that um, very precisely with uh, copy count. Uh, copy count works even for reactions that have an inefficient PCR reaction. Greg mentioned during his mechanism-based description of PCR that the slope of the PCR curve is an indication of the efficiency of your PCR. And in this case here, this is, has a, a relatively shallow slope indicating that this PCR has a lower efficiency. And yet, we're able to still get an accurate quantification from this PCR. You can see copy count said there was 933 molecules in this particular single well, and digital droplet said that there was 945, so excellent agreement. Um, we've uh, shown that this method works on a wide variety of instruments that we currently support, from Life Technologies, Roche, Kyogen, Strategy, pretty much any instrument out there. If someone has a new data format, perhaps we can show you that. All right, so in conclusion, um, so far we've shown you that the shape of the qPCR curve contains a lot more information than I think was previously appreciated by the field. Um, the qPCR copy count method allows us to make every single qPCR well an absolute qPCR analysis. Um, an important point about copy count is that it provides actual counts of DNA rather than CT values, which are much easier to interpret. It does not require a dilution series. We do not require internal external, external calibration standards. And the results that we get are instrument independent. So in conclusion, um, we have shown um, what the title of the presentation was, that you can use your existing QPCR machine to get absolute quantification without the need for a standard curve. All right, at this time, I'm going to give a brief demo, and then we'll have questions and answers. All right, so for the demo, I need to open up our company homepage briefly. This is our company homepage. If you are a user of ours, you would just come here to log in. If you are, had not logged in previously, uh, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Let me just, I'm just going to log out here and log back in for a second. All right, so I'm logging in. This is If you were a new user, you'd have to register. Once you register, you come in. We have two products, QPCR Copy Count and Thermoblast. We're doing Copy Count for today. All right, so I mentioned earlier that running a calibration plate was simple, so I'm going to show you how we run a calibration plate to get that single molecule fluorescence. All right, so we just click on that. On this window, we're going to load in our PCR data. All right, just got to go to this here. All right, so this is just a small little data set um, that we ran with 336 replicates. Close this up here. All right, very good. Um, next, we need to make a few entries here. We need to provide the sample volume, which was 10 microliter reactions. We need to provide information about the amplicon length, which was 87 base pairs. This particular DNA uh, target is double-stranded. It does work with single-stranded RNA or DNAs. Like if you did a cDNA library, you could use it for that. 
You have to choose whether the detection is TACMAN or, um, or cyber green, and then you need to give the primer concentrations, which in this case is 300 nanomolar for the primer and 150 nanomolar for the probe. And this particular reaction did not use MGB. All right, so we hit run calibration plate, and that's it. Just that simple. Uh, we'll take a minute here. Uh, if I click here, I can see jobs that I've run previously. This one is currently working. It just takes a moment to finish. All right, let's see here. I can click here briefly to see if it's done. It is. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the results for that calibration plate. That was run in real time on our cloud-based computing. All right, so it's now um, just putting together the results to display them to you. And here are the results. So for this calibration plate, it was able to determine that the mean copy number was 1.61 molecules per well on average. We were able to quantify the amount of delayed onset. So 0.139 means that on average, about 14% of the molecules of the PCR reactions were delayed. This is an effect that occurs only in the first few cycles of PCR, but we were able to quantify it. Down here, it provides you with the Poisson distribution, observed versus expected. And you can see for this particular plate, it did pretty darn good for given that this was only 336 wells. All right, so that's it for a calibration plate. As a user, you don't even need to understand this stuff. If you just run a calibration plate, you're set to go. Next, I'll show you how you would run a typical set of unknowns. All right, so for an unknown, a set of unknowns, a whole plate of unknowns, um, oops, new project here, here we go. All right, we just need to load in a, uh, a sample data set. In this case, I'm going to load a titration series. Software is completely unaware of what the actual number of copies are in these wells. So I loaded in that particular um, uh, that particular data set. You can see it automatically detected that this was from a light cycler instrument. Next, we need to just provide it now with uh, the volume of the reaction. A very important parameter in PCR is the total reaction volume, 10 microliters in this case. Oops. And then all we need to do is provide the assay that corresponds to this. this is, we need to tell it that, hey, this is an existing assay. This is something we've done before. All right, I need to find this particular one I just did. What was it? What was it titled? I have tons of You can see how many assays I've run before. Any of these will work. There we go. All right, this is the one that I ran. So I'll select that. You can see how many assays I've run, thousands. Okay, so we then just say proceed with these. Um, it automatically recognized that there were groups of replicates in that um, data set, which the user had called dilution one, dilution two, et cetera. All right, let's see. I think I have one more click to make here. Yeah, submit job. All right, and that's it for your unknowns. Now, remember, you never have to run that calibration plate again. That's a one-time event. So I could run, you know, thousands of uh, unknowns in the future, plate unknowns, and we can see it. So here it is here. This already finished the job, so we can take a look at it. All right, and... Um, we can click here to view individual wells. It will show you the quality of the fit for each well. All right, that particular well has a no template control. You can see it has zero molecules. Dilution 1 was a very low dilution. This particular one has Poisson sampled and it has nothing in it. Dilution 2 had an average of about one and a half molecules per well. And you can see that this particular well had two molecules in it. And then you can see as you go up the higher and higher dilutions that the copy counts are increasing. And you see that, as Greg mentioned, as you increase the D0, the curves are shifting to the left-hand side. All right. Down here, it gives you a, a, a summary of the averages of those dilutions, all the wells that are in a particular. So dilution one had these particular wells that made it up. 
and you can see these uh, numbers here. Now, how good are these numbers? Well, dilution 11, for example, contained by digital droplet PCR 153,000 molecules. And we observed by copy count 151,590. So all of these numbers are very, very close to the actual values that were observed. This number is the worst of the values, dilution 1. The actual number is 0.15 molecules. Um, and we see it a little bit off, and that's just because there's only 14 replicates in this case. All right, so that ends the demo. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Johnson briefly to just talk about our introductory offer, and then we will take questions from the audience. And we're right out of time with what we promise. Hello, so I'll, I'll quickly go through our, our QPCR copy count introductory offer, and then I'll, I'll moderate the, the question and answer portion of today's webinar. So until November 1st, QPCR copy count will be available at the introductory price of $99 per month with a three-month minimum or for $999 per year. Uh, what this provides you is up to 50 96 well plates per month or essentially 4,800 wells. Uh, we also want you to know that the cost of your pipette tips for a typical user will provide you digital PCR quality results from your existing qPCR data and instruments. Uh, you should also know that this offers risk-free. Uh, as we've always done with our software in, in our course of 14 years in business, we provide a money-back guarantee. So you're welcome to try a cop qPCR copy count with, the, um, with, with no risk in our ironclad uh, money-back guarantee to give you peace of mind. So with that uh, being said, I'd like to sort of open the, the question portion. We've already had some questions asked during the, the course of the presentation. If you have a particular uh, piece of information, please reference a slide or title or, or slide number even. That will be helpful to us as we uh, back up the presentation and address that, that point. So, and of course, uh, this is a listen-only mode at this time. So type in your questions uh, in, the, in the type in field on the, the right margin. So the first question was, will pricing be covered? And, and that's, uh, that's why we went to this slide. And uh, hopefully that answers questions. If there's more, feel free to contact me uh, directly. It's joe, J-O-E, at dnasoftware.com. And I'd be happy to answer any pricing questions you might have. Uh, the next question I see is, does DNA software just provide software, or do you also offer consulting services? I'll, I'll give that to John. Um, yep. In the 14-year history of our company, we have um, prided ourselves in um, tackling some of the most difficult projects in the field. Um, we do that both with our design services as well as for copy count. So we've done some very large contracts already with um, pharma and diagnostic companies to um, validate QPCR copy count and to show that it works for their particular applications. The next question is, has this uh, research been published? So we, we have a white paper that I'll, I'll share with folks following up the webinar, but I'm going to give that to Greg, who can speak to some of our, our publications. Yes, yeah, so uh, the original uh, paper on Mach 2, uh, which I uh, talked about before, uh, was published in 2010 in the journal PLOS One. Uh, and there was a, another paper that was a comparison between 10 different novel uh, qPCR quantification uh, methods. And uh, that was published in 2013 in the journal Methods. Uh, so, yes. There's also a, a lot of content on our webpage that um, users can go about, and there's a nice section there about what is counting PCR and some of the validation studies. All right, any other questions? Sorry. Yeah, another question is why is this cloud-based software? Uh, why, I'm sorry, why is cloud-based computing good for this application? Mm. This is good for this application because um, the models that we're running are very sophisticated and um, the amount of computation that we're doing, the cloud allows us to do this in a scalable fashion. It also allows us to support our customers better with um, uh, the latest updates of our software. We just update the cloud, 
and it prevents users from having to contact their IT departments in order to get permission to load on the new version of the software. So there's actually a lot of advantages. It also allows us to offer it to you at a very low price, um, and users don't have to fuss with different versions of software. So another question is, what are the most common applications of copy count? Um, so far, most of our users have used copy count for um, mRNA quantification and for copy number variation. Um, so we've had people from uh, academic institutions um, who've used it for that. Uh, for both of those, we've had uh, mainly for the um, expression analysis. We've also had users from um, large diagnostic companies who use it for uh, quantification. Some agricultural companies have used it for the copy number variation. Uh, we're hoping that in the future we'll be able to validate the viral load uh, applications. I showed you one slide on that. Um, and that's something that's a work in progress. Uh, and also we're interested in applying copy count to um, next generation sequencing or quantifying fragment libraries. Uh, we haven't demonstrated that yet. Uh, one of our customers actually has, has used it and told us it worked, but we haven't validated it in-house yet. So we're hoping to bring that out later. Okay, the next question. I understand that I can calibrate with one reaction volume and then run samples with another reaction volume. Is that true? Yes, that is absolutely true. It's one of the novel aspects of our technology is that when you run a calibration, uh, it's really only dependent on the composition of the primers and master mix. So once you run it for one, you have to give the correct volume when you run the calibration curve, and you have to give the correct volume when you run your unknowns. But having given those, uh, you never need to rerun. So for example, we have run calibration curves on the open array, which has 33 nanoliter volumes and use that calibration on instruments that had 96 well plates that had um, volumes all the way up to 100 microliters. Actually, one of our customers did that, uh, validated that the method worked. Even with that extreme, six orders of magnitude change in volume, and the method was able to calibrate just fine. Okay, the next question, how do you take off the background accurately? Isn't there a lot of error in the background fluorescence? Great question. Um, you know, we are doing mechanism-based fitting. So the mechanism um, has a very particular shape. So when we're analyzing that qPCR curve, we're pulling out the component of the shape that has from that PCR. Whatever is left is the um, background. And so we actually very, very rigorously subtract that background on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis. So that's one of the tricks about how we do what we do. Okay, another question. What are the procedural challenges with generating a calibration plate? How easy or difficult is it to find the appropriate dilution to greater than three copies? Less, less than, than three. three copies, I'm sorry. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so we have on our website a nice little two-step calibration procedure. So what we recommend users to do is to um, just take their any DNA target amount. You know, I know that there's a little bit in there, some amount, um, and run it in un calibrated mode, where we use the estimation for the calibration. That is close enough, you know, we, I told you that the errors for cyber green calibration estimated are about 10% error. And for, for TACMAN, the error is 20 to 40%. That's good enough. So what we recommend is that they run a, a quick um, one sample to four sample um, uh, calibrate, uh, uncalibrated mode. That gives you an approximate copy number and tells you exactly how to dilute your sample to get it below three molecules per well. So it's actually pretty easy to do it. Okay, another question. So once you have the calibration and you can apply that to any sample run with the same primers and conditions, review why I can use this calibration for samples run on any instrument. Oh, that's a fabulous question. So. Unfortunately, I can't really tell you how we do that, but it is true that if you run uh, the calibration on one instrument at any volume, well, as long as you know what that volume is, you can run it on other instruments. So uh, we've actually performed, we had one instrument manufacturer who um, tested that claim very rigorously. 
They tested it with um, five different instruments, <laughs> with um, five different volumes on each instrument, using five different assays on each instrument. So they did 125 different assays in order to validate that claim. Uh, we've had other customers um, also test it and show that it uh, worked as claimed. So yes, we can do it. Um, we can't really tell you exactly how we do it, except for to say that it's not voodoo. It's all based on deep knowledge of the mechanism of PCR. Okay. Next question. What types of customers do you have and, and who buys copy count? Okay, well, um, we've had um, customers from academics. So we've had a customer that did a large um, contract for the Department of Defense at an academic institution. And um, they uh, purchased copy count, uh, licensed a copy count, used it for that, validated it. We've had customers, as I mentioned, from the agricultural uh, community. So we have two large ag companies that have um, tested our software, one of which is using it, one of which is um, uh, currently evaluating it as, uh, still. Um, we've had customers from, um, well, we've had a, a number of large diagnostic instrument manufacturers who have validated the technology. We're working with those companies to see if they would be interested in incorporating copy count into their instruments, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, and we're working with a variety of researchers who are interested in applications for like viral load testing, for example. So we've, we've had quite a few customers from a very wide variety of segments. Some customers have done massive validation studies. We understand that our claims are bold and a lot of people want to test it uh, and really show that they're true. We now have so much confidence in our claims that um, we're just moving toward selling the software. Another question is how does, I think what the question says, is how does the PPCR assay design have to be compared with standard CQ type assays? So maybe the question is, is there a difference to consider in design? Um, so generally, um, if your PCR, so let's say this, the TACMAN assays are less sensitive to design quality than the cyber green assays are. So cyber green requires rigorous design. If you're, because everything that gets amplified gets detected in cyber green. And so if you have multiple amplicons all getting detected in the same well by the same fluorophore, then that means that you're going to get a curve shape that is not from a single analyte. So if you design your primers properly and they only amplify one target for cyber green, it works great. So it's much more demanding for cyber green. TACMAN, on the other hand, design is uh, not as important. Um, however, I will, so basically our mechanistic base fitting takes into account um, some of the things that, some of the consequences of poor design. So poor PCR design might lead to poor amplification efficiency at each cycle. And that is accounted for. As I showed an example of that earlier in my talk, um, I had shown an example where there was a PCR with low efficiency, which is one here, low efficiency at each cycle. So the design is, um, uh, I will mention also, if it's a poorly designed set of primers, then you'll get a larger amount of delayed onset, which we do quantify. Um, and uh, let, lastly, I would talk a little bit about invalid wells. We have a we have a, a mechanism for actually evaluating the quality of the PCR curve to tell if that PCR is the shape that it should be. Uh, and so, wells that are or PCR reactions that are poorly designed will sometimes have a high percentage of those poorly shaped PCRs, and we can identify those. It's a rare event, but it does happen once in a while. Okay, so that's all the questions that we have uh, at this time. I would just like to uh, share our contact information again. Uh, you are welcome to our website uh, where you can send us inquiries. It's dnasoftware.com. We can be reached by phone at 734-222-9080. I can be contacted directly to purchase the software. Joe, J-O-E, at dnasoftware.com. And we'd like to thank everyone for uh, 
making time for us this afternoon to attend the webinar. Uh, and we look forward to uh, following up with some of the, the great questions we've had today. We, we look forward to presenting a, a series of, of future webinars to tackle these types of questions. Absolutely. Um, users are welcome to contact me directly, John San Lucia, John at dnasoftware.com, or Greg Boggy. Greg, D-R-E-G, at dnasoftware.com. And we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. All right. This ends this webinar. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye-bye.